Thank you for joining us for our second Siteman Learning with National Leaders, presented by Siteman Cancer Center at Barnes Jewish Hospital and Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. I'm Carol Daniel, your host again. This is the second installment of our Learning with National Leaders series. October, as you well know, is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. So we decided to center tonight's discussion around breast and gynecologic cancer. We'll be focusing on treatments, the importance of screening, and some critical efforts everyone, including you, of course, can make when it comes to prevention. Now, Seitman is an international leader in cancer treatment, research, prevention, and education. Its renowned Washington University physicians treat 70,000 patients each year in six locations across Missouri and Illinois. Of course, that means we have an incredible panel joining us tonight, surgical oncologist Catherine Glover Collins. Thank you so much for joining us. Also, surgical oncologist Andrea Hegeman and medical oncologist Andrew Davis and genetics counselor Susan Jones. Thank you all for coming and uh, being with us this evening. This is a powerhouse panel, of course. So we wanna give you information tonight that will set your life for health and for joy even. And a reminder to our viewers to submit your questions right here on this website. We're gonna to try to get those answers for you throughout the evening. So I want to start with some important statistics when it comes to breast cancer. And we've got some graphics that, that we'll show you here about breast cancer. It's the most common cancer among women. 80,000 women are diagnosed each year. It is the number two leading cause of cancer death in women and it is strongly encouraged you to seek genetic counseling if you have a strong family history or a known inherited breast cancer gene. Now, women hear so much information about mammograms, about breast cancer, and related topics. So, Dr. Glover Collins, you are first up. We want the viewers to not tune out after this when we start talking about this kind of a topic. There's a lot of great information ahead, so please stick around. But if you forget anything, everything, or anything, what's most important that we should keep in mind tonight? Well, early detection is the best, and the best way to do that is through breast cancer screening with mammograms. Say it again. Breast cancer screening with mammograms, early detection. It is that, it's just that simple. Screening, of course, it, it's an important part of diagnosing cancer sooner uh, when it is more treatable, correct? Correct. So what should women know about being screened? Because here's what we think <laughs> about being screened. Some of my friends use the phrase, time to get the boobs smashed. It's uncomfortable. It's painful. It's uncomfortable. What should we think about when it comes to screening? Well, I think one of the major things we have to realize is, is it's once a year, and depending upon when you talk to your, um, your primary care provider, it might be two times a year, I mean, every two years. Uh, but no, it doesn't have to be painful. If it's hurting, when you go in, you have to speak with the technologist. You have to be your own advocate. But it's important, and it's, it's once a year, five minutes, 10 minutes, and you're done. We can do that. Okay, we can do that. So you're telling me that I should say, ow, this hurts, and, and there's something they can do. So it should not hurt the way it does for yes. some women. For some women, yeah. Me included. Okay, this is not about me tonight, it's about you. <laughs> Let's talk about screening guidelines. What should we be aware of? In general, we, we like to think of starting at the age of 40 and getting one every year. Um, there are lots of different guides out, guidelines out there. If you look on the American Cancer Society web, uh, website, um, the U.S. Preventative Task Force, you know, they break it down by different age groups. But a good general rule of thumb is get a mammogram when you hit 40 and get it every year. Okay, I want someone to ask about dense breasts because we're gonna take your questions, okay? We've got some questions already coming in, so I know someone's going to ask about that. But for those, um, Dr. Davis, who have not been screened for breast cancer, are there common symptoms that they should be aware of? I think it's first important to note that most of these cancers that we're hoping to detect are asymptomatic, meaning that you know a woman is not having any symptoms, and those are the ones that we really want to detect early because those are the most treatable. Um, there are certain things to look out for. If, if a woman knows a lump, either in their breast or under their arm, uh, any persistent skin changes of the breast, or a 
pain in a particular area. Those would be kind of alerts to say, you know, contact your primary care doctor and let's get a mammogram now. What kind of skin changes uh, should yeah, we be looking for? That's, Go ahead. that's a great point. I said, don't forget nipple discharge. Uh, I see a lot of women with breast pain, and, uh, you know, that's the first thing that a lot of people who have cancer and have really large uh, masses in their breasts, they're like, oh, it doesn't hurt, so it can't be cancer. Mm -hmm. But actually, cancer is usually painful, painless unless it's starting to grow into something like your ribs or growing out of the skin. Mm. And so a painless mass or nipple discharge that's bloody or a discharge that's coming out on its own, those are all things that should be red flags. Get in to see your doctor. And you were going to, you were going to, to respond to the skin changes that we may see. What should we be looking for? You mentioned skin changes. Particularly redness of the, the breast. That's something that... Um, is something that you should uh, be alerted to and really seek medical care quickly. Um, there's a specific type of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer that can be quite aggressive and we want women to seek medical care quickly. All right, let's see if we have some questions. We, we know that we do. Um, here's one question. My sister and I both tested positive for the BRCA2 mutation. Um, our other sister tested negative. What are the chances of getting a false negative on that particular test? Yeah, I, I can answer that. I mean, the, the chances should be small as long as the test has been done through a reputable laboratory. Um, and we would want to be careful that the testing was done uh, fairly recently because there have been some changes over the years um, in terms of better detection on, on that testing. Um, if anybody's concerned about, uh, uh, you know, I assume that we'll be sharing phone numbers and people will be able to reach us, but if anyone is concerned about the validity of their testing or whether their testing is current enough, they're welcome to reach out to us and we'd be happy to look at that for them. And so when you say current, if they got that a year ago... A year ago is still current. It's still current, okay. Yeah, test, yeah, testing that was done, you know, prior to 2010 sometimes didn't include the, the, all the technologies that we have now. And another question, thank you, Gina, for that question, from Tammy, is there anything new to treat triple negative breast cancer? She says, I was rejected for immunotherapy, not sure why. So there are new and exciting treatments for triple negative breast cancer. Um, immunotherapy specifically is, is uh, indicated for particular target, um, but we do have really exciting clinical trials. We're exploring immunotherapy for all types of triple negative breast cancer patients. All right, one more question and then we're gonna move on to more, more conversation with our panel. BRCA2 positive, 51 years old, premenopausal, um, other ophthalmectomy, you guys, your doctors, you can say that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it necessary to take tamoxifen uh, to reduce breast cancer risk? That's a very specific question, but I know you can handle it. Um, well, the first I would say is that it, it sounds like um, this woman has undergone an ophorectomy or a removal of the ovaries and likely fallopian tubes to reduce her risk of ovarian and fallopian tube cancer, which is also increased with the BRCA2 mutation. Um, it's important to note that the estrogen that the ovaries secrete is really what probably increases the risk of breast cancer. And when you go through menopause, then your ovaries aren't secreting that estrogen but the mutation itself still causes a risk of breast cancer, so we still want to be vigilant and we still would turn it back to our breast um, surgeons and oncologists to talk about that risk. Oh, definitely. And so um, whenever we have a high-risk breast cancer patient, such as uh, this person with the BRCA2 positive uh, mutation, we nor normally talk about risk reduction in one of two ways. Taking those medications like tamoxifen or Remedex has been shown to reduce that uh, risk by 50 to 60 percent. Uh, uh, but also the risk-reducing mastectomy. And a lot of people wonder, well, can I get it? If you have a mutation like that, then yes, you, you insurance company is supposed to pay for it with the reconstruction. I'm so glad you brought that in. That's a question I'm sure everybody is asking. Um, Dr. Davis, we're going to have some more questions in, in a little later, but Dr. Davis, can we talk a little bit about other types of prevention? What, what prevention specifically? I mean, there's, there's so many ways to think about breast cancer prevention. I think one, when we think about prevention, we want women to live a healthy lifestyle. So exercise, uh, eating healthy, controlling weight, um, limiting excess alcohol. I think those are you know, key things to keep in mind. And then really engaging with a primary care doctor for important cancer screening. So breast cancer screening, 
uh, colon cancer screening, you know, basically all the appropriate uh, screening is the really the best way to find things early. Now, this is not a curveball at all because I know you've, you've been hit with this question and anyone can pick this one up, but I have colleagues who have not been to the doctor, they've not had physicals in years. Uh, I just wonder how often you see women in your office and this was the resulting first time that they'd had any kind of exam. They were not getting mammograms. Are a lot of women that you're seeing not going to the doctor? It's fairly common, uh, but the great thing about living in St. Louis is we have this program called Show Me Healthy Women. So it's for the underinsured, uninsured people who don't have primary care physicians. We get you in for these health screenings like the mammograms and the cervical um, pap smears and to get you into the network. You don't have to have a doctor in order to get a mammogram. You can self-refer yourself. You know, that's why we have these mammogram bands that go out to all these places that don't mm -hmm. necessarily have access to mammography. You can go, you don't have to have an order. Anybody can go and get a mammogram. I think of all that will be said tonight mm -hmm. that that's a light bulb moment for a lot of women because you're thinking, I don't have a primary care doctor. I need the doctor to refer because that's what we always hear with so many different treatments. Uh, and follow-ups that we get, we feel like our doctor needs to refer us. And that's the first time I've heard a doctor say, you don't need to do that. You can refer yourself for a mammogram. Mm -hmm. You can refer yourself <laughs> for a mammogram. Okay, you got that? Um, Dr. Glover Collins, you talked about the importance of mammography um, as an early detection tool. Can we also discuss reducing one's risk of breast cancer? I know that there are studies at Washington University and at Siteman that suggest ways to do that. Can you tell us more about that? Sure. Um, Siteman has done a lot of research into uh, risk reduction and, and prevention, and they came up with this uh, program called the Eight Healthy Ways. And actually, Dr. Davis has touched on several of them. Healthy lifestyle, maintain a healthy weight, and how best to do that, exercise, get your uh, fruits and vegetables into your diet, limit alcohol, don't smoke. But a couple of other things that we have to consider, birth control pills, being on them for prolonged periods of time, do increase your risk of breast cancer, but have other good effects like for ovarian cancer risk. They so actually decrease your risk for ovarian cancer. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one of those important things where you have to kind of tease out what's important for your, your health at this particular point in time, and then where do we go so that we can be, put, have you on these birth control pills for as small of time as possible to receive the most benefit for what's going on in your life. And then avoiding hormone replacement therapy. I know that menopause is a horrible thing for a lot of people. Ooh, Lord. Uh, flashes, <laughs> night sweats, everything. Um, but we, again, that's something that you want to limit being on. If you're not really having problems, you shouldn't probably be on it for 30 years. We know that it increases your risk. Even the estrogen only versus estrogen with progesterone. And then finally, there are medi medications, which we kind of already touched on, mm -hmm. the tamoxifen and Arimidex, that reduce your risk. And that's generally reserved for people who are considered high risk for breast cancer. And you find that out by going and getting a risk assessment by a qualified person. That leads us, I think, into um, more from Susan, our, our genetic counselor on the panel tonight. Talk about um, any link between family members, sisters, aunts, mothers, daughters who have been diagnosed with breast cancer, how common is this and, and what should we all know about it? Well, a fam uh, breast cancer always has a family history component or often does. So the first thing that we can do is offer genetic testing to families where there is a strong family history. It's always better to start by testing someone who's been affected with cancer if possible. Um, but we never want to stop any patient from coming in to see a genetic counselor and asking for their own testing. We're always happy to, to talk about options with them. Um, we can do genetic testing and look for a gene mutation that might explain why there has been breast cancer in the family. If we don't find a gene mutation though there still can be family history based risks and genetic counselors are qualified to and other professionals also are qualified to um, to do some assessments to look at um, an individual woman's personal risk for breast cancer based on her family history and some other personal factors um, some women who who have normal genetic testing um, still should be made eligible for additional screening such as breast MRI for example I remember um, interviewing a doctor many years ago saying the older we get, the chance of any number of cancers just becomes a higher thing because 
your bodies break down. Does it matter the age of your sister, aunt, mother when they develop breast cancer? Right. Well, we do get more concerned if the breast cancer has been premenopausal, so b roughly before the age of 50. Um, but we are we always are happy to talk to any family members who are concerned because, um, you know, if, if you have multiple family members who've had a breast cancer after the age of 50, we still can, you know, talk about your personal risk and consider whether testing would be appropriate. Do people get nervous when they hear, their, when their doctor says, I think you should get genetic counseling? Do they get nervous? And what does it, is it a simple blood test? Yeah, well, genetic counseling is the process of coming in and talking with us. Talking oh, the genetic about, testing, yeah, I should say, yeah, not the counseling, okay. yes. Well, just be, well, people may get nervous about both of them, but, um, <laughs> but coming in to see a genetic counselor and we talk about family history, we kind of go over all of the information and we discuss the, the ins and outs and the, the pros and cons of genetic testing. We're never there to push genetic testing on a patient, but to provide all of that information and allow them to get their questions answered. And then if the patient wants to move ahead with genetic counseling, we can help them do that. Um, so we hope hope that we, you know, by providing that information, we're, you know, dispelling any fears or anxieties that our patients have. And that's really why we are doing this series, to do just that, you know, to further inform you, so you have deeper information and deeper awareness and understanding so that you are not afraid. And we all know that knowledge is power and knowing your family history can help you make choices that could easily change the game when it comes to cancer prevention. Here's one family story. This is cute. This is the one we had blown up right, at your birthday party. party. Right. Yeah. This is when I was going to be a dancer. I'm 80 years old, raised six children, and I was very healthy all my life. And then I discovered I had breast cancer, which was pretty shocking to me because I didn't think we had cancer in the family. I had four weeks of radiation and kind of sailed through that with no problem and then just kept on with my life and didn't think about cancer again. So when I was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, I was shocked. The surgeon at that point said, well, there could be a link between the pancreatic cancer and the breast cancer, so we would recommend um, genetic testing for some kind of gene mutation. The oncologist confirmed that she did indeed have the BRCA2 mutation. A gene mutation is a variant in the gene. It's basically a misspelling. Not everyone who inherits a mutation in the cancer risk gene will have cancer, but they do have an increased risk for cancer in certain areas. So that's a big part of our job is to, to explain about inheritance patterns. And um, in this case, there was a 50% chance for the, Noreen's children to also have inherited the same gene variant. BRCA2 is a gene that increases the risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreatic cancer, and also melanoma. Bridget did pursue genetic testing and she found out that she was positive for the gene mutation for the variant. Having that knowledge definitely helps with decision making. For me personally, I will be getting an MRI of the breast and then the mammogram every six months. And since ovarian cancer cannot be screened for, I also made the decision to remove the ovaries, fallopian tubes, and uterus to mitigate that risk. How are you? you know, when you have a diagnosis of cancer, that's it. You have it 100% and maybe your choices are more limited. Here, in a preventive setting, you have a lot of choices. By Bridget doing the hysterectomy with removal of her tubes and ovaries, she has reduced her risk of ovarian cancer from up to 20%, increased risk down to about 1%, which is really the general population risk. It's really important to have a multidisciplinary team that is actively engaged in um, the management of the whole person, not just one organ, because it's, it's more than that. Knowledge is power. It's important to have the knowledge and then make whatever decision is best for your health and your family. My name is Mary Claire. Bridget is my cousin and Noreen is my aunt, Aunt Noreen. I'm 22 and I found out that I was BRCA positive as well. It was a lot to unpack, I'm not gonna lie, but talking to Susan was so easy. She was kind of like, you know, we're here, we've got all this information. I think that's part of me being a planner. I wanna know what to do. Like, I wanna know how I can be the best at each, each step, so I'm kind of just taking it that way. It's not good news or bad news, it's just news that I can use in the future. 
Genetics can be complex, and so it's a part of my job to try to explain genetics to people in a way that they will clearly understand it and be able to use that information to make the best decisions for themselves and for their families. Dr. Hegeman, I'm going to bring you in, but I wanted to, because Susan said something while that video was, was uh, rolling that we need to restate so everybody can hear that. We learned that you can refer yourself for a mammogram. You don't need a primary care physician to do that, but the same is true of genetic testing. Yeah, genetic counseling and genetic testing. So you can actually call Washington University Genetics and just ask for an appointment. Simple uh, we don't, as we that. We don't require a primary care provider or someone to send you. That is so wonderful yeah. to know. Okay, Dr. Hegman, as, as we just saw in that video, inherited cancer risk can result in different types of cancer, including gynecologic cancer. So I want you to talk about that and also when is it time for someone to actually speak with someone like Susan with a genetic counselor? Yes, well, I think, you know, when we're... We, as we mentioned in the video, I think a multidisciplinary team is always great. We love it when we can all work together. In fact, we do quite a bit. Sometimes Dr. Glover Collins and I are operating together. We're often doing referrals back and forth to each other, working together to figure it out because just having a BRCA mutation, for example, it's a, a widely known gene mutation, one and two, that can increase risk for breast cancer, but it also has implications for ovarian and fallopian tube cancer possibly even uterine cancer for BRCA1 mutation. So we always want to discuss how to reduce those risks, you know, depending on the age of the patient and depending on their fertility desires, if they're younger, um, all of those things go into the consideration. Um, so once we know there's a mutation, then we can do the things to, to prevent the cancer. If there's just a cancer risk in the family and you don't know, we always suggest genetic testing. It's not the only thing that's going to tell us about cancer risk, but it sure does give us a helpful, you know, quantitative number to, to go along with our counseling. All right, that is excellent to know. So we want to check in again. I'll put my, my eyes are almost 60 glasses on so I can see these questions. You guys have some great questions this evening. Um, here is one, how do I find a surgeon for my triple double mastectomy involving some spread to lymph nodes as well as reconstruction and what is the process? Okay, um, so it sounds like this person has a triple positive breast cancer. So when we talk about breast cancer, we talk about things called receptors, estrogen receptor, progesterone receptor, and HER2. Most people don't hear about triple positive, they really hear about the triple negative. But so she has a, a HER2 mutation, which makes her her great candidate for the chemotherapy up front. And so what we know is, is if you respond to chemotherapy up front and we are able to melt your cancer away, you have a better prognosis or a better, better su survival risk uh, from your cancer. And so generally we would send you to chemotherapy first. You do that for about four to six months and then you come back for your surgery. A lot of people opt to have a double mastectomy. It's not obligated that you have a double mastectomy if you have a triple positive cancer and spread to lymph nodes. Um, it's, it's really a discussion between you and the surgeon. And then um, the reconstruction, we often start that at the same time. So we, whenever we know you want to do a mastectomy with reconstruction, we send you to the plastic surgeon so we can have those surgeries together and, and keep the ball rolling. Um, and then to find a surgeon, the easiest way is Siteman Cancer Center website, schedule an appointment with the doctor, and we'll, we'll get you in with one of our So I just, I'm surgeons. on the website, I'm looking. Make an appointment, breast surgeon, we got you. Just like that? Just like that. <laughs> it doesn't seem like it'd be that easy. It is. <laughs> we, yeah, I think Dr. Glover Collins brought up a number of important points. Um, we really work together as a team, you know, for patients like this, we have conversations on kind of order of how do we incorporate surgery and systemic therapy and potentially radiation therapy as well and really try to personalize the pro approach based on the type of tumor uh, to ultimately give the, the best outcome for the patient. So we do work together as a team to do that. And I think you raise a really good point is that we're trying to personalize your care. And I tell all my patients, your breast cancer journey may not be the same as your sister's journey. For sure. Or your neighbor's journey, or your church member's journey, because the things that we're recommending is based off of your cancer. And so uh, I think that's a really large point to drive home is, is that everybody's cancer is different and we wanna do what's best for you. So 
It's not just that we want to send you down this straight path. Mm -hmm. We want to personalize it for you. Is it likely they've met with you before they've chosen and then choose a surgeon? Or I would imagine somebody's watching and they want you all to tell them rather than going to the website and choosing. They want to know from you, because I'm sure you've been asked, who's the best, who should I go with? <laughs> I'm get, having my surgery on Thursday. <laughs> who's good on a Thursday? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I would say, I would argue that all of the Siteman doctors at breast, uh, in the breast center are great. Uh, and it's really a matter of finding the one that you, that fits your personality. Um, my partners and I, we are always willing to, if you're not happy with me, I have my partner right here. She's willing to see you and we will get you straight. Okay. And that goes along for the other divisions as well. Yeah. And, you know, I just always tell everyone I'm just so lucky to work here with these wonderful colleagues and, um, you know, all of my partners I would send my family members to in a heartbeat. So I think that, you know, we, we are all here working together. So. Yeah, we know that people come from around the world to go to Siteman. We know that. We are so lucky in St. Louis. Let's take another question um, to go with my question about um, finding surgeons. This is a follow-up. Um, just started chemo for breast cancer. The last treatment should be December 20th. Would like to line up surgery soon after. So definitely we need to get her into the clinic so we can get her uh, associated with the surgeon and then get her to the plastic surgeon and we'll, we'll get her. We typically would like to do surgery within four to eight weeks after completing chemotherapy. Okay. Um, and so if we can get her in now, having her surgery by January is probably would be our tar target. And because everybody's journey is different, not everyone going through chemo is going to have surgery necessarily, but mm -mm, yeah. most Everybody likely, that goes through chemo should a person surgery. choose that surgeon before chemo or it just, it's personal for sure. Typically we try to have all of that, uh, all of those people in place, but if she doesn't have a surgeon, um, we, we definitely would be happy to see her. Okay, here's another question. Um, my maternal grandmother, mother, a sister, a niece, and me all have had breast cancer, yet testing has not yet identified a gene. Yeah, I mean, it's not really a question, but it's, but yeah, I mean, it, it happens. It and, happens. And that kind of goes back to what I was mentioning earlier, that there still is a family history component to breast cancer in many families, even if there's not a gene mutation that's been found. Um, and there, you know, we, we do our best to, um, to create a, a family history-based risk assessment for anybody in the family who is, is curious about other testing that they could do, other screening that, that would be available to them. Um, and it, it's always worth checking in with a genetic counselor as well, just again, to make sure that the most current type of genetic testing has been offered. Many times in years past, women were just tested for BRCA1 and BRCA2, and now we tend to test for a large number of genes. We do fairly full genetic testing panels. There are about 14 genes that are specifically related to breast cancer alone. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, we'd want to make sure the testing was up to date. And I would love you if you ask that question, you can, um, because I know that our team behind the scenes, they have all your information, but you can ask that question and, um, and add to that question, I should say, when did you get that testing? Mm -hmm. If it was 10 years ago, you, we've made strides since then, so you might want to get it again if, if you need to know. Yeah, and again, we always welcome people contacting us and just asking us, you know, here's what I had. Can you look in my chart and see what I had? Or, or they, can, they can share their mm -hmm. information with me. Um, is, it, is it up to current standards? And we're happy to look at that for them. I love this. This is such a great discussion. Um, so, Dr. Davis, a question for you. We, we know that great strides have been made in the treatment of breast cancer and the survival rate is better than it's ever been. Can you tell us about some clinical advances um, that you think are noteworthy tonight? I think it's a really exciting time. Um, Dr. Glover Collins mentioned there's different subtypes of breast cancer. So there's kind of three main subtypes, hormone sensitive, HER2 positive, and triple negative. And really in all three of those areas, we've had new drugs approved very recently that really improve outcomes for patients. So it's really exciting time for you know, all breast cancer patients to get better treatments. And uh, we've already discussed as well um, advances in the treatment of breast cancer. Um, there are, those are the results of course of years of research into the disease. Um, is there recent research you think that will further advance breast cancer treatments in the near future? 
There's certainly a lot going on. I think the big picture, which we touched on a little bit, is this idea of personalized or precision medicine. Um, how do we give the right treatment for the particular patient and the particular breast cancer? And we're identifying better targets, better biomarkers, and, and better ways to, one, find the right treatment, and then also to manage some of the, the side effects and toxicities that may occur with uh, chemotherapy or targeted therapies. Um, let's switch to um, gynecologic cancer, point out some important statistics that we um, want you guys to know um, about that. All right, we don't have those stats yet. So, Dr. Hegeman, what are the most common types of gynecologic cancers? Sure. So, we have, you know, that we treat ovarian cancer, fallopian tube cancer, uterine cancer, and cervical cancer, and vulvar cancer, and vaginal cancer. So, those are kind of, you know, the reproductive tract and, and those mm -hmm. organs. Uh, most common is actually endometrial or uterine cancer. Mm -hmm. That's the fourth most common cancer to affect women, and it's one that kind of goes under the radar. So I would like to bring it up tonight, you know, not as often associated with a BRCA mutation as we've d talked about a lot. There can be hereditary forms of endometrial cancer as well, um, but it's such a common cancer, um, and the preventive methods that we talked about with healthy weight and making sure to um, you know, have a healthy weight, um, diabetes and high blood pressure and weight are actually the three biggest risk factors for endometrial cancer, aside from the genetics. So that's a huge one to just bring awareness for. So anyone with abnormal uterine bleeding, not a regular cycle, if you are off of hormonal birth control, you should be having regular periods up until menopause, and then any postmenopausal bleeding is a sign to get checked out for uterine cancer. The other cancer that we haven't talked too much about yet is cervical cancer, and that's a cancer that is less common in the United States thanks to our pap tests and screening tests. However, we still diagnose it, unfortunately. Uh, but we've made great strides in the treatment for cervical cancer as well. And we now have a vaccine that can actually prevent cervical cancer. So that's huge. And we've talked a little bit about ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. Um, those are cancers that are really hard to screen for. We don't actually have good screening tests for higher in the reproductive tract. And so unfortunately, we diagnose those cancers often at later stages. That's where genetic testing comes in. If we have a a known mutation um, that we can find uh, before a cancer develops, then we can take steps to reduce those risks. Vulvar and vaginal cancers are much more rare, but I would encourage every woman to know that if there's any skin changes on, you know, near the opening of the vagina on the vulva, that's something to get checked out immediately. We often get treated for, for those things with, you know, maybe it's a rash or you get prescribed a cream over the phone or something, it's really important for someone to look and to make sure that doesn't need to be biopsied because it could be a sign of cancer. I'm familiar with some of what you spoke of. I, I'm happy to say that I'm all clear, but I've gone through what I know some of your patients have gone through. And so that I'm curious then about the typical age uh, range for women who are diagnosed. Yes. You know, the typical age range, I would say, we always hesitate to talk about that because we want to make sure that we are screening everyone um, you know, at, at, from early on, for sure, that they're familiar with gynecology care. But the typical age range for ovarian and fallopian tube cancer is going to be around age 60. Uterine cancer around that same age, maybe a little younger. Um, and it, we're diagnosing uterine cancer, as I mentioned, because of its increasing prevalence. We're diagnosing it earlier and earlier, sometimes in premenopausal women as well. Um, cervical cancer is a disease usually that affects maybe younger women, but it really depends on kind of risk factors and whether you've been in screening and gotten the appropriate work up there and things like that. So kind of all age range, right. I would say. But well, let's just get real. I mean, for all the postmenopausal women who are watching, you know, any bleeding. Yeah, got to be worked up. First of all, we made it through all that, and we are no longer having a period. And so right. when there's something that hap that's happening, yes. you're not only like, wait a minute, <laughs> this shouldn't be happening, and that is the issue. It shouldn't be happening. That's right. And the good news is that that bleeding is a sign, right? It's usually a sign that brings people into our office. So again, if you don't have a doctor 
call us up. We're happy to get you in, even if you know it's just similar that the message has already been provided tonight. But, but definitely that's a sign that usually brings people in. So we're lucky with the uterine cancer that it usually has early warning signs, and we can detect it early. Detecting early, screening is big. Absolutely, screening is that. That's one of our catch words tonight, catch phrases tonight. Get screened. What should women know about being screened? Well, one thing that's sometimes surprising is that when you get a pap test, it's actually just a screening test for cervical cancer. It really doesn't screen for uterine or ovarian or fallopian tube cancer, like you might think it would screen for all the reproductive cancers. Um, but the cervical screening test is, it works. Um, we test now for both just abnormal cells on the cervix, but also for HPV or human papillomavirus. But that's what the pap test is doing. So. Once you have, if you've had a hysterectomy for other reasons, had a removal of your uterus, you actually don't need a pap test. You may age out of the screening to, to need a pap test, but just to know that that doesn't really account for uterine or ovarian cancer screening very much. Sometimes there it's more important to know about symptoms that you're having or the bleeding as we talked about, pelvic pain, abnormal bloating or feeling full quickly. Those can be signs of more of an upper reproductive cancer. I, I, I think I, um, it was either a commercial, public service announcement, I, I can't remember, but pain during sex is... Absolutely, that's something that also should be worked up because that could be a sign of a, a mass on the ovary, mm -hmm. it could be the sign of, I mean, actually sometimes that even can detect other cancers such as a colon cancer or something like that in the abdominal cavity. So, you know, anything that just, you know, really pain is a good warning sign for, for most things and should bring you in to talk to someone. And I, I, I don't want to embarrass anybody, but I, I, I'm almost certain that a lot of women, your mom didn't necessarily have a lot of conversations with you, and her mom didn't have conversations with her. And so for me to say pain during sex isn't necessarily normal is not something that mom said to you, because that's not a conversation that you're having with mom. Um, and then a lot of moms are not, we're not having conversations about what your menopausal experience was, so women don't know necessarily. So it's, that's why another reason that I, I'm so happy to have you all here tonight in this, that, that our uh, discussion is so important. Let, let's talk a little bit about screening guidelines. Can we, what should we be aware of? What should women be aware of in terms of screening guidelines? Right, so the most common, you know, again, the guidelines are very clear for cervical cancer. And they're actually updated as we learn more about human papillomavirus and how we test for that. So now we have a test that screens for HPV, human papillomavirus. If you aren't affected with a high risk HPV, then your chance of getting cervical cancer is very, very minimal. And you actually don't need another pap test for five years if your HPV test is negative. Now this changes with age. Our, the younger you are, you're going to clear HPV with an intact immune system. So we're very lucky that younger women actually clear their, their HPV very quickly. As we get older, it becomes harder. And so that high-risk HPV then can be worked up with a microscopic exam of the cervix or biopsies or even procedures that can remove some of the abnormal cells before a cancer is found. And so that's the number one way to prevent cervical cancer is to have those screenings at appropriate guidelines. There's been some confusion over the past years because those guidelines have shifted um, to not be every year. You know, you think of going to the doctor every year and getting your yearly pap. That's just something we've commonly grown up right. thinking. And that's really changed as we know more about HPV. So again, if you don't have HPV, high risk HPV, you don't necessarily need to be screened every year. We want to minimize harm too, and mm -hmm. that discomfort that comes with having to think about going to the gynecologist. So we don't want to do too much over screening, and you know, have have problems there too. Family history of, of gynecologic cancers does that make a difference in screening recommendations? Um, so it absolutely does. So I think, you know, again. It's confusing because cervical cancer and HPV, that really isn't a hereditary component. So if you've been affected with cervical cancer, it's unlikely that your daughters will have an increased risk for cervical cancer. Uterine and ovarian and fallopian tube cancer, really different story. We really want to, um, you know, those things can actually be more affected in a hereditary way. And it all comes back to seen Susan for genetic testing really to associate that. <laughs> and, and she's lovely really so it would be great. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> and for those who haven't been screened, um, we always want to talk symptoms, common symptoms that, that uh, those who are watching um, should be aware of. Yes, so again, ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. Now there are screening tests, I do want to point out, especially for high risk women. So women who do carry a mutation that increases their risk for ovarian and fallopian tube cancer. Again, the screening tests don't work as well as mammograms and MRIs for breast. But we do have ultrasounds and we do have a blood test called the CA125. Very tricky with those guidelines because it hasn't been shown to change outcomes, but it might be better than nothing in a high risk population. In the general population though, unless you're having pain or um, you know, symptoms of bloating or abdominal pain or we can palpate a mass on exam, there may not be a role for screening ultrasounds for everyone. So it's really important, again, an individual conversation with your doctor to work up what's going on. All right, let's go to another uh, question. Outside of hysterectomy, what are common treatments for endometrial cancer? Is precision personalized medicine being used? 100%, I would say across the board for all cancer right now, that is the goal, is to again identify mutations that have caused that cancer. They actually might not be hereditary, they might just be happening in the tumor itself. And so for endometrial cancer, we are, we are screening all endometrial cancers for something called mismatch repair, or another term is microsatellite instability. That's something that can actually, um, whether it's hereditary or not, we can actually use that to treat specifically um, that mutation in the DNA with immunotherapy. So that's a, a, a new treatment that we're using. It's FDA approved for use of endo, for endometrial cancer if a mutation is found there. And that goes for other mutations too. We really do a lot of somatic profiling that's testing the tumor for what mutation is driving that cancer. And we can have targeted treatments for that. Your excitement is palpable. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I, I would agree with Dr. Davis. It's a very exciting time for cancer care because more treatments are being approved, um, you know, thankfully for breast cancer, but also for gynecologic cancer, which has been a very understudied type of cancer. So we are seeing more for cervical, endometrial, and ovarian than we've ever seen before in the past few years, which is so exciting. And one more question. What new strides are being made in finding a cure for cervical cancer? Yeah, again, I think, you know, again, like any cancer, we go back to prevention and, and really making sure that we're vaccinating our, uh, the vaccination age for HPV is really in the kids. So 11 to 12 year olds are the target population to get vaccinated so we don't even have to deal with cervical cancer in the future. That's really the ultimate way to, to cure it. However, once you have a cervical cancer, again, exciting things with um, things like the combination of immunotherapy and something called bevacizumab, which treats blood vessels around the tumor. Um, we're also seeing now um, a new FDA, two new FDA-approved drugs for cervical cancer in the last couple of months. So we're making progress. All right, let's go to some more questions. Um, this next one, after having preventative uh, mastectomy for BRCA2, G mutation, is there a need for annual screening for a mammogram, for breast MRI? That's a good question. So after you've had the risk-reducing mastectomy or preventative mastectomy, we do not do any screening imaging unless you have a problem and then it's not screening, it's actually we're investigating the problem. So no mammograms, no MRIs. You do normally see the surgeon or a um, high risk breast cancer specialist and then we'll do an exam every six months to a, a year. Um, because when cancer presents after mastectomy, it's usually a lump or something of that nature. Okay, one more question. Um, Tammy asked if I've had all my treatments, can I go on something that will control triple negative? It's a great question. It depends on the circumstances. Um, we typically, for that type of cancer, would, would give some sort of chemotherapy or chemotherapy and immunotherapy before surgery. Um, and then as a medical oncologist, I would see the patient after surgery again and then make an assessment based on how much of the tumor was uh, eliminated based on that treatment to decide on whether there are additional treatments that work and to decide whether those would be right for the patient. All right, no one, I thought someone would ask about the dense breasts. We're gonna wrap it up, but I will ask about the dense breasts. Um, for those who have them, how do they know 
that they have it and what should they be concerned about when getting regular mammograms and they have dense breasts? And what is a, what is a dense breast? <laughs> So dense breast just kind of refers to the amount of breast tissue that a woman has in her, in her breast. When we're younger, under the age of 40, you tend to have denser breast tissue, more breast tissue. Then as you get older, that breast tissue is replaced with fatty tissue. Um, and that uh, the term 3D mammograms used to be a big buzz phrase before maybe about two or three years ago. But now there's legislation in place that basically says that the insurance company can't can't uh, charge you more for getting a 3D mammogram. So pretty much everybody gets 3D mammograms now. Uh, but it is very important for people who have dense breasts to do the 3D mammograms because it helps us catch those small masses on the mammogram that would otherwise be missed by a regular mammogram. Thank you all so much. What a great discussion. It went too quickly. <laughs> it went too quickly. I want to thank all of our panelists for taking the time to join us tonight. Dr. Catherine Glover Collins, thank you. Dr. Andrea Hegeman, Dr. Uh, Andrew Davis, and Susan Jones, thank you so much for your time tonight and for your insight. Thank you. We appreciate that. Now, make sure to sign up for our next Siteman Learning with National Leaders discussion. Our panelists will join us on January 12th, 2022. That discussion will focus on lung cancer. You can start signing up for that event tomorrow by coming right back to this website. As always, thank you for joining us. Be healthy.